Good afternoon, all. Uh, welcome back uh, after a lunch session. So we have I think, two challenges to fulfill. First is keep you guys interested and awake after a lunch break. And second, we'll want to talk about the challenge of uh, interoperability. So with the context of uh, what are the problems of interoperability, what are the challenges uh, enterprises face, um, the vendors and the industry face. And we would like to cover that with respect to few perspectives. The esteemed uh, panel represents uh, individuals from vendor products. So we, we have a perspective from a vendor side, as well as from an enterprise side, which most of the problems persist, as well as from an industry standardization interoperability perspective, as well as from a systems integration point of view. I think we are a good uh, uh, panel that can cover all aspects of interoperability challenges. Uh, we try, we'll try to cover three dimensions, or rather three uh, themes within the uh, 50 minutes we have. First is, what are the challenges enterprises face with respect to digitalization or, or for any matter like how we, we can um, have um, seamless integration, data, uh, data strategy and data architecture, purely from a prob what are the problem statements um, enterprises um, uh, find. And secondly, we'll look at what are the different patterns, what are the architectures, what are the approaches uh, that exist that have been adapted and proven. So we look at from a vendor perspective, as well as from a um, uh, enterprise perspective and from systems integration uh, integration perspective. Thirdly, then we look at um, what solutions uh, have been implemented. Again, looking at from a product and from enterprise perspective. So those are the three themes uh, we would like to cover. And to make it interesting, rather than we wait until End of the panel questions, maybe uh, to keep us all of us a bit awake, maybe anybody can raise a question while we are answering the questions and we can go through the questions. And also, you have a slide uh, to raise any questions um, uh, as well. Yeah, I think that's it. So let's start with, uh, let's go through the introductions. Uh, let's we'll start with Andre. Yeah. Andre Yeager, um, around about 18 years in the commodity trading and risk management space. Um, I started originally on the open link side, joined an ION wired acquisition. Um, have been kind of started on the implementation side, um, went into what we call pre sales, demoing the solution to various clients, and then eventually um, ended up in product management. So I'm responsible um, across the different products that we have in the portfolio. Um, you might familiar with open link, Allegro, right angle, aspect, and triple point. And yeah, based on that, I represent that vendor solution viewpoint today. Hello, I'm John Yenter, and my name is spelled C-A-N, but pronounced John. It's a Turkish name. So before you can look for who is this Kang guy that he didn't pronounce himself, so that's me. Uh, I'm with PwC. I run our commodity trading technology group. And uh, uh, my background is really, again, in com you know, heavily in commodities technology. I've been around this business for about 20 years, maybe more. I, st I was in different roles throughout my career. I was uh, anywhere from software development all the way through to software uh, vendors with OpenLink, with SunGuard, when it was SunGuard, and uh, now at PwC. So we'll, well, I'll try to give you guys a little bit of uh, insight on what we see from a more of a consulting angle. Um, my name, thanks. My name's Anthony Hammond. Um, I work for Luxoft. Um, so I'll be representing a system integrator's point of view. I've been working in trading risk management for about 22 years. Um, I actually started my career in back and middle office. So I'd like to think I've got a bit of a business perspective as well. And hopefully I'll give you some views on what we see as the common problems and good approaches. Hi, I'm Chris Sass. I'm one of the co-founders of a company called Fidectus. We do post-trade um, settlement and post-trade work for companies. And we talk interoperability every day. If you were at the dinner last night, you would have seen me giving interoperability awards out. I've got over 20, 25 uh, years in selling new and emerging technologies, mostly uh, for enterprise, telecom, governments. Uh, went into energy a number of years ago and love to share the experience we had talking about interoperability today. Thank you. My name is Frank Stolten. I'm with Marmanaft. I'm within the energy trading business for uh, 18 years already. It doesn't feel like something like that. Um, 
and uh, I'm happy to share uh, with you some experience and insights around our digitalization journey from an um, IT management perspective. Thanks, gentlemen. So, introduce myself, Sajinder Jason, um, actual CIO for Targary. Targary is a uh, North American based uh, commodities trading company focusing on renewable uh, energy, biodiesel, biofuel, um, carbon credits stock and other metals related to battery and solar. So pretty much focusing on the sustainable um, energy uh, and commodities. So my background as most of our like 20 plus years in the technology field started as a software engineer in exchange product development within NASDAQ and then um, in, the, in the valley working on um, high-end uh, high-tech uh, uh, systems. Uh, and then um, I worked in the city here at Deutsche Bank for about 10 years, uh, working as playing as different CTO roles within the trading and risk uh, investment banking divisions. Uh, I've also worked on, on a vendor side as a CTO for a CTO or a vendor as well. But now, since for the last four, uh, four months, I'm playing the CIO role. So from my side, I've seen both sides of the fence, like many of us, um, the vendor side, the enterprise side, different problems, different solutions Yeah, we're trying to solve. That's great. So let's start with the, the first uh, theme is about um, what are the problems uh, enterprises face in delivering I2 solutions, um, uh, whether we're using commercial products, off the sales products versus in-house build. So Frank, you're coming from a big uh, commodities trading um, company. What are your perspectives? What are your problems uh, that you see and you're trying to solve? Yeah. Let me start uh, sharing some experience and some insights with our end-to-end um, -end digitalization journey. So in general, we see different capabilities for integration within the different applications, right? And additionally, or on top of that, we see also the different technologies for the com communication between the different systems and between the different applications. So taking into account what we are talking about, we are talking about, in general, two um, integration methods. As we all know, one integration method is the the standard interface between two different applications. And what is coming more and more into place is to provide um, data access points, so to say. Uh, these are, let's say, more and more getting common. Why? Because uh, we need also to support uh, the business within making a decision-making process. So they need just the data and uh, not, let's say, being integrated on an interface level. So in general, what are the, the key problems and challenges which we face? So we have uh, a huge number of integration points uh, implemented within our um, system and application landscape. So if we take a look at a specific deal lifecycle, for example, so after a deal is confirmed within our traders environment, Everyone involved, everyone, let's say, in terms of uh, our counterparties, supplier, customers, brokers, uh, shipping companies, everyone wants to receive is a, their specific information which are, which are related to that specific deal. And for sure, as we all know on our private end, near to real time, right? And, um, but in general, where's the demand coming from? So there are two aspects. One aspect is the demand for these kind of uh, interfaces or interaction points are coming from the outside. So outside means, uh, as I said, from the involved counterparties. But sometimes, and this is what we see in current times, also technology is driving, let's say, uh, one of the demands. Uh, if we all have heard about that, uh, for example, it's, it's a block blockchain technology. If we take uh, the inside look into our organization, then we see a need to increase uh, yeah, efficiency, transparency, and making sure that the data are going across the different applications. So therefore, we talk about typical um, interfaces. So <clears throat> what are the reasons for our problems which we have? So we are facing that on a daily basis. I think everyone who is sitting here on, on the panel, and potentially you too, uh, we are not on the greenfield approach, right? We need to manage, let's say, what is in place with our customers, with our suppliers, with our counterparties, technology-wise. So sometimes uh, I would say, to my knowledge, uh, we have uh, the situation that we are missing standards. More standards would help. On the other side, I'm also facing areas where we have too much. So there's sometimes a trade-off, making sure we have good standards defined within, let's say, the different involved businesses. 
if it comes to our trading activities. Um, the other view on that is that we sometimes face the challenge that every ap application delivers and provides different capabilities, as I said. So sometimes just a poor API, so an interface technology is missing, which we have to work around. And um, we see uh, definitely an increase uh, in demands, everything around security. So this is the security aspect is coming more and more important. And um, therefore, we see a high demand. And I'm not saying it's adding complexity, but it brings in a, a, a different uh, additional layer which we have to fulfill. So how to deal with that situation? I think there's not an easy answer, and this is not a, a one answer. So there are a couple of items which we are taking into account. And what we are doing is, let's say, to design a digitalization roadmap, not just internally, also with our counterparties. Um, we are bringing up some guiding principles internally, so to setting up, let's say, priorities, um, what we are aiming for in terms of before we go for a flat file, we want to uh, go, let's say, for an API. So we are pushing ourselves and also our involved parties to, to join us that which is journey. Um, and the other challenge is um, if it comes to uh, data, data um, is a specific topic. Why? Because as soon as you move between or across applications, you get the issue in making sure that the reference data are always the same. So that, that the product codes are meaning they're the same, that the locations are the same, that your customer numbers are the same. Um, and this is um, uh, one of our, let's say, um, a roadmap where we say, okay, this is something where we need to, to create a kind of governance. It's a big word, but I think it's necessary to ensure that we can also run reports cross locations and cross business lines. Yeah, and last but not least, uh, give to, to, for the last topic, I think it's uh, thinking about is it really required and helpful for, for all of us to implement um, integration layer, which sits in between the different applications. There are a couple of pros and cons, but it would be good, and we see a big value in that, to go through that journey, if that makes sense, uh, and, and, and helping you um, to, um, to uh, deliver further capabilities to the business and your, and your counterparties. I think this was a couple of insights, uh, yeah. Sandra. Thanks, so. Frank. Thanks uh, to give you a good insight from an enterprise perspective. But I think as you, as you uh, mentioned, uh, most of the time the business consumers needed their data yesterday. So not like in you know, one month's time. So there's a big, big disparity between the velocity of the da their data needs versus defining a even evolving architecture step by step. So definitely it's a challenge I think all enterprises uh, face. And also other challenge I think faces um, if you have a lot of uh, commercial off the shelf products, I mean, how, how does those products evolve and provide the data uh, the businesses need? For example, if it's a CTRM product or ATM product, we have a defined data structures. Can we get, that, get the data out on time, real time? So there are different other perspectives as well. So maybe for another question for Andre, like as a, from, coming from a, a product side or vendor side, what are the problems you face trying to serve the different data needs of the clients? As I can... I don't have to solve that particular problem from an enterprise perspective, but I can share what we see through our client interaction where the demand is. I think a key focus for us uh, that is asked for is to kind of free up some of the data that sits in the CTM. I think back in the days, we we're comfortable to kind of have some real-time or near real-time reporting capability directly in the system, but I think we're seeing more and more demand that that data needs to be pushed out because there's other data sources you want to combine with, doesn't matter weather or asset information, but it's just a broader set of information that you want to combine uh, from an information perspective. I think the other two key items is there's definitely an ask for having more standardized integration because if it's something that's kind of a standard market provider with a service, doesn't matter if it's a broker or an exchange, then nobody wants to deal with that on their own. They want to have a vendor that's just kind of delivering that plug and play connectivity. Um, at the same time, there's, I think as, as Frank talked about, there's a lot of variation and connections that need to be done to non-standard uh, systems or non-standard information. So it's key to kind of have a framework in place that kind of makes it easier to connect to data where you have kind of scalability built in, fault tolerance, 
um, security. So this is the main key items that, that we are focusing on from freeing the data up on one side, on the other hand, and providing kind of more connectivities, especially now in context of the broader portfolio of solution that we have, um, as well as kind of enabling the client to utilize a framework to kind of connect to that legacy solution or to a new solution or in a very specific way, uh, in a flexible way. No, so like I was listening to the previous uh, panel sessions today. Um, so traditionally, let's say trading and risk systems pretty much um, process uh, structured data sets. Even still, we can't standardize the data. It's all um, uh, different semantics, different ontologies, different uh, meaning. But now we are, we are looking at unstructured data sets. We are looking at ESG, like um, uh, environment, social governance data sets, um, spatial data, uh, map data, et cetera. So which pretty much by itself unstructured. So the problems uh, becomes exponentially hard, harder problem to solve. Um, so anything that maybe if I ask Chris as well, um, from your point of view from looking at, uh, you see the problems that maybe the industry as a whole may be facing within looking from structure to like unstructured data sets as well. Yeah, I, I think along with what Andre said is, is from our point of view in post-trade, we need to get data out of whatever ETRM, CTRM that you're using. It's irrelevant to us. So you, you want standard connections there. But I think the problem statement from interoperability then goes is in post-trade, you always have a counterparty to consider. And what I need to be able to do is talk to the entire industry. I, I need to have reach to everybody in a way that's scalable and easy to do. And that's more what we see. So the data structure, whether I get it from SAP, whether I get it from you know, ION, it won't matter to me where I get the data and how I act on it. But the interoperability part comes, hey, if I'm doing confirmations, if I'm doing electronic settlement, I need to reach the entire market. You know, the old monopoly that we had in the past, that didn't really work. It didn't get you innovation and technology, and it didn't do things to drive the business. And, and so what we're seeing is that change, but not the data structure so much. Okay. Well, thanks for that insight and clarification. I think we discussed a lot of uh, topics with respect to the problem statement. If you try to move into the... Uh, Second theme, so what are we going to do about it? So we understood the problems from an enterprise and from a product and an integration perspective. If I throw the question to John, um, so from your diverse experience within the consultancy and from product domain, what do you see as best practices uh, that people are looking at and how to solve from architectural, from a governance and perspective? Yeah. So I think what we're really seeing right now in the marketplace is, you know, one thing that I wanted to add here is there's a lot of move also into the cloud. So how does, a, how does my cloud integration work? What am I gonna do with that cloud data? How am I gonna integrate that whole thing into the cloud? So what we're seeing a lot is, is in that space, we're seeing people trying to integrate into their cloud providers, the data sources, the, the API driven, the cloud API driven uh, uh, data connections to their legacy and also their other uh, software that they have or their cloud um, software that they have. So we're seeing that quite a bit in in, uh, in our clients, and and another kind of trend that we're seeing in the in the marketplace at the moment is how do I incorporate some of my data that I have with the processes that I have, so that I kind of weave this into a into a what do I do with it? How do I provide the data that I currently store somewhere to the right people that are going to be using this software, this software, this this data, so that they can actually they don't have to go about doing all sorts of data mining inside of the organization but they actually take that data and use it as they're going, essentially orchestrating this whole thing. And there are some, some software tools that actually do that, or now that the cloud providers also provide this kind of application support for you so that you can get that in and, and use that. So the, and the third element to this is, again, from a building your whole application architecture and your integration architect architecture, how do you involve your security upfront so that you don't actually fall down on that side going forward. So you think about these things early on and you build that into your into it so that you properly connect, you know, you connect your your citizens, your ecosystem into your data. But however, how do you then block that from unwanted data that goes in, unwanted requests that are coming in? Because as we're seeing, there's a lot more data that's available. We're generating a lot of data and we're ingesting a lot more data. And how do we provide that that those kind of containers for that for this element this so, is getting really so how do you avoid the garbage in garbage or problem because right. there's so many sources like unstructured structured data not yeah. curated or curated verified 
uh, how, how do you how do how, how does that being solved? Like, is there like ideas like within the industry or your, your perspective how that is addressed? Um, so what we see a lot is, I mean, in the energy space especially, it's not very. Uh, you don't really see a lot of standardization in the financial markets. You see that a lot more, but in the energy space, you're not seeing that standardization. So I think that's one of the areas. I think as a whole, as a group, especially the group here, uh, the the representation here could do a lot better. And uh, but I mean, one of the things that I'm seeing is there's a lot more push from some of our cloud providers, uh, that be Microsoft or 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 AWS, to kind of build industry-specific tooling so that they will actually help out with that drive. Okay, no, thanks for that, uh, Anthony. If I ask the same question from a, coming from a systems integrator and working in the industry for 20 plus years, what do you think? What are the best practices and approaches um, you yourself and the rest of the uh, team are looking at? Well, it's, it's interesting. I think that the topics that everyone's talked about today, we see in different forms at different levels. You know, some organisations you walk into and you know what the problem is. They've got lots of manual work around. Their trading and risk management system is bloated because it's doing all the work of all the other systems. You know, it's doing all the mapping for finance and everybody else. It's, it's become a de facto archiving system, all sorts of things like that. What we see as the best approaches, or not necessarily the best approaches, but good approaches are to use systems and applications for what they're designed for. So keep your, your core trading and risk management system lean so it can do what it's supposed to do. The second one um, is decoupling integration. You know, I think we've all talked about that point-to-point -point integration. It does the job, but it locks you in. You know, and then when you try and change, your systems are so closely coupled that a change for application B imp impacts directly application C and testing is difficult. There's changes to be made at both ends. So I think one of the biggest steps can be to impl implement some sort of middleware. Now, that can vary in size and shape depending on what the organisation is. It could be an enterprise service bus where you can do some transformation, some filtering, some routing, or depending on the size of the organisation, you might need real-time uh, streaming. So you might look at Kafka, something like that, but then if you're supporting a legacy stack, it may not be compatible. So maybe a combination of the two. So you can use your ESB as endpoints for the legacy uh, and use your, your streaming um, platform to, for enterprise data, market data, the things that you really need. Very good. Uh, thanks for that. So how do you uh, have seen your former experience? How do you manage the disparity between, let's say, you have commercial products, you want to access set of data out of the system. It doesn't provide the uh, right access uh, semantics or the, the veracity or the velocity uh, with real time. Yep. And then uh, you pretty much build um, ecosystem, homegrown ecosystem, uh, pretty much blocks product upgrades or pretty much yep. breaks the whole architecture. So have you seen that sort of uh, uh, patterns being used uh, as well and what, what sort of uh, approaches uh, so have been worked on? I think it kind of takes us to the next two levels there. Um, so we've, we've talked about data warehouses and data lakes, and I think that is an inevitable part of the strategy. Maybe a data warehouse for structured data, um, for, you know, reg reporting and things like that where you know what it is, and a data lake for your as yet unknown purposes to provide business insights and potentially to hand some capability back to your business users. So, you know, inevitably when the business users come and say, right, we want to see what's been happening in this space over the last six months within the organisation, the information is there. You can put the tools on top of it so they can be self-serve. Free up the burden on technology to do things that only technology can do and give the users the opportunity to solve their own problems to some degree and avoid that game of misinterpretation. Is this what you want? No, it's not quite what I want, that type of thing. The other big one um, that I'm a big fan of is having a separate enterprise data management system. So often we see multiple systems using the same reference data, but different versions that have been created in everything. Historically, that's often been mastered out of maybe the trading and risk system, which may not be designed for that. So having a centralised system where your data is captured once, captured right, you've got your data provenance, you've got your data lineage, everyone's consuming the same version of the data, it just reduces an enormous amount of problems, reduces the need for reconciliations, the problems that come from different versions of the same data. So I think those three layers, for me, are the things that... They don't solve all of your problems. There's no magic bullet, but they give you the tools to work around and have that segregation, applications to do what they should be doing and other tools to do the tasks that your trading and risk management systems shouldn't be doing. Okay. It's going to add a, a feedback there because 
I, I think what I just heard was a very IT answer to the problem. And, and in my that. world, um, finance has their own system. Set back office has its own system. And all these folks have different things. So what you want is you want a source of truth. I want to Absolutely. have the same data. So that part I agree with. Yep. But there isn't a lack of technology that's allowing it. It's a business problem that, that's having those silos. Because certainly from a settlement point of view, I bring back and the, the, the finance group doesn't tell the back office that they got paid in the legacy systems. They don't know if they got paid or not. They know they sent an invoice out and it matched and it was all great, but that information isn't making it back. So part of what interoperability is doing yeah. is I can't remove those business silos, but I can get the single source of data to be available throughout the systems. Yeah. And so I can fix the problem slightly different than saying, hey, you're not going to have separate systems because I can't fix that problem today. That's, that's politics. I don't do politics. Yep. But on the technology side, what I can do is say, I can make this data available to all of you and we'll feed it back to your system if you choose to accept that in a way that you can handle and ingest. Yeah. So I guess one thing to add to that, I think I agree with you on that because you do want to remove your silos. And sorry, we became a bit free flowing. No, that's uh, right, that's right. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> yeah, we just became a free flowing uh, thing. Definitely. But um, yeah, so I think I mean I completely agree with you. But I think from an interoperability perspective, we need to look into the the what business problem we are solving, because normally what we do is it's a data problem. I'm going to connect system A to system B, but we don't think about what the mm. back to your point of all these you know these silos. So how do you break that? Because at the end of the day, there is a a business process that says this is what I'm going to do. I mean. You know, we write a bunch of, you know, processing controls all over the place. But then how do we use that process of controls to be able to actually, it's not a desk warmer somewhere. It's basically somehow you check off these things and you weave those into your inter, you know, your interactions, your, your interfacing and your, your interoperability is actually, I think, is the answer. Yeah. And, no, I was just going to say, um, I think you've got a really good point there. You know, if we really look at it. Technology is dust and enable here. We have to focus on the business process, the needs of the business consumers, and support that through technology. I've certainly worked in some organisations where technology holds the power and, you know, you've got the tail wagging the dog. Everything needs to be business-led. Business need to describe what the, they want, how they want to interact with the rest of the market, and technology needs to support that with the tools that are available. Let me add maybe one, one, one aspect to that. I'm definitely not a fan of... Uh, to say is it uh, IT driven or is it business driven? At the end, I think we need to manage that as as a joint effort, right? So I think at uh, some point, I think also our organization needs to be adapted to the challenges with which we are facing, right? And therefore, I think it's also a more agile way to bring people together from, let's say, the different uh, experts, right? So one from IT, one from the business, and then, then I think we could be um, easier move move ahead, right, and solve issues. Yeah, that's good good dialogue. So. Coming on to you, Chris, um, coming from a, uh, <laughs> from a, po a post-trade um, industrial standardization point of view, what are your views and what are your team working um, towards industrial standardization, post-trade um, uh, processes point of view? Yeah, so for post-trade, like I said earlier, it, it's about reaching everybody. That's what's important. So the data we just talked about, what, what the stakeholders internally are, but what you want to do is you want to be able to have the flexibility to have a platform that talks to all the elements you're going to need, right? So foundationally, what folks are building today in post-trade is they're putting the foundation for the future of the killer app. We don't know what it is. We started with electronic settlement matching. We had confirmation and, and we have regulatory reporting. All these things fall today under post-trade. But what they also do is they're facilitating the future. So if you look at today's market, let's say with cash flows and things like that, well, I have post-trade um, dynamic discount, I can do settlement, I can do settlement quicker. There's all things that are moving the business, but what's really happening is you're getting the data, you're putting the pieces in place, and what I wanna do is have an open ecosystem where I can talk to the best of breed other elements so that I can put them in place as they become available quickly and be more nimble. So yes, we have to talk to the legacy infrastructure that people talked about, but what's really important is, hey, why so much effort and in interoperability is, how do I reach everything that's out in the market today so I can get the value back into my business? That's what we're focused on. So uh, just to add on, on this particular and maybe take a step back from, from my side, we, we assembled now a decently sized portfolio where I think we have a decent size of trading volume that going through the different solution. They're definitely not at the moment standardized and doing everything in the same fashion. But I think it's a, that is a significant focus for us to kind of create that business value or create value for, for the community that was assembled under that 
uh, ion label, and it's all about kind of standardization across the solutions, is packaging some of the contents, is getting eventually doing a reference data service or static data service where you ensure more conformity across um, kind of those different systems that are currently in place. It's about kind of building more shared components that work in a similar fashion. It's uh, about adopting some industry standards on the technology side. Um, and why do we want to do it? Because I think it enables us at the end to kind of provide additional business service on top of that community, because at the moment it's very kind of distributed across the different systems. Um, but there's a lot of value to kind of providing that access. And this is something that we want to uh, try to figure out with new services, but it might be also where we see there's some some exciting capability that's in the market where we say there's just in value to kind of connect that. And then it's not about kind of that each client has to figure out how to co collect to Allegro, or how to collect to our open link to the um, to that particular service. It's just that we want to kind of enable the community to take advantage of that business capability that brings value. And as I said, it could be done from us or it could be a partner in this case, like uh, yeah, Predictus is a great You guys have in an context. interface, a common interface going to our platform. So all your market can reach everybody else in the market because you chose to invest in a connector proactively and build that and let the market reach post-trade, right? That was what Ion did. Exactly, and this is, I think that's their focus what I meant earlier also, I think a lot of people are tired to figuring out those individual um, integrations. So I think it's part of the vendor to kind of enable that further. And I think one of the enablers is to figure across these very different CTMs to kind of increase the level of standardization. I'm building on that point, Andrew. So your, your products has been deployed in multiple plans. They have their different trade models or deal sheets or risk models. Uh, so how, from a product point of view, how do we facilitate that sort of interoperability, semantical mapping or ontology mapping or even syntactical mapping? So how, how will your product suit um, try to address that uh, problem from enterprise to product integration perspective? I think this is not for me the important point. The important point is that the client doesn't have to figure that out mm -hmm. because yeah. it's about in this particular case, effort put the standard out. And I'm a fan of, and I talked yesterday to Gavin, and he was one of the people that kind of drove uh, confirmation matching back in the days. There's a huge benefit out of kind of mm -hmm. enabling capabilities like that. And I believe it's very similar to electronic settlement matching, um, more frequent payments, much better for credit risk, trade finding. So there's a lot of value if you can automate that particular functionality. But you need to, or we now that we have that portfolio, need to enable the community to take advantage of that by figuring that out. How do we kind of have that one connector That's to right. Predictus or to another service and then kind of make sure that we synchronize it to, doesn't matter what the underlying product is, aspect, right angle, open link. So that's the key, key, key aspect for us to solve. And that's how we can create value in this context. So do you think like, the financial industry has standardized, I mean, 10 years back, we have SWIFT, ISO standards, FIX, FIX ML, likewise. Do you think the commodities industry will try to converge from a product side up as well as from an enterprise's point of view, will converge into a similar standardization model? It will it, take time, but do you think that's sort of forthcoming? I think for standardized trading, we should have more standardization yeah. than we currently have. I think there's there's always an aspect as we we definitely I talk to a lot of guys that come out of the banking world and I always would say commodities is still slightly different it's not exactly yes. banking and I think it's still key that the market is continuously evolving energy transition certificates PPAs I think there's the physical aspect it's just you need to kind of have flexibility uh, of the solutions so to support that, but there's a certain amount of trading that's happening in the commodity space that's highly standardized, and we need to kind of get more standardization around that, make it simpler to integrate to certain services or to whatever the particular business need is or how we create value. It needs to be simplified in this context. But, but to add to that, from post-trade perspective, we did something unique. EFET got together. The industry got together and created a standard. So if you look at ESM as an example, mm -hmm. this is totally backwards as a vendor for 20 plus years. Typically what you do is you go win the market, you become the dominant player in the market, and then you roll your standard out to the market and become a de facto standard. 
for energy, what we did with settlement, we said, hey, let's get all the stakeholders together. They knew they wanted to have straight through processing. They knew they wanted all this value and they created standard first and we released a standard there. So interoperability was already defined from the get go from EFET. So when a vendor like ION or, you know, when Samir over there or any of these groups integrate into Fidectus over here, what that means is you now have reach out to the entire industry because I don't care what vendor you happen to use. If you're still on the legacy platform, if you haven't had a chance to update your ECM or any of that yet, we can still talk to you because the standard's already in place today. And that's what's different. So it's a little different on the front end of coming out of like your system where you talk to us, but from parts of the element, EFET's all over it and there are standards in place and there are vendors implementing those standards. Yeah, thanks for that. Uh, Frank, maybe if I throw the question back to you, so we started with defined from enterprise problems perspective. And we discussed different standardization from product perspective and with Chris as well. So, so from your point of view, what are the solutions and approaches you have implemented like in the enterprise scale, like whether it's using an evolutionary architecture, enterprise service bus or some other data fabric. So how do you or your team have solved the interoperable problem or actually still working on it, but still fine, but do you like to hear this from us? This is why I phrased it as a journey. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> I would say here and there we have started the journey, taking a look into, let's say, what do we have? So just some insights we have uh, within our, around our ETM trading system, more than 70 in interfaces flying around. And I'm not talking about uh, so much uh, uh, about integration points where we get or maybe we pro just provide data access to or provide the, the poor data for business analytics or and other use cases. So I, I, again, I think it's, it's still a journey and uh, as the demands are getting more and more and uh, the time to market is also, let's say, uh, very pushing on that. I think it's, it's good that you spend some time and thinking about what is required for the next couple of uh, years and making sure that you have a roadmap and that needs to be aligned with the business roadmap. And I think that, uh, that is, uh, from my point of view, one of the key elements um, to, to ensure that you are doing uh, what needs to be done in terms of having a good business case. Yeah, w one thing that we're seeing um, quite a bit lately is like a bit of a, okay, I'm gonna build this whole fabric. I'm gonna build this whole you know data lake, whatever I'm gonna be building. But there is that, that old days of, you know, I wanted to build a warehouse. Um, million years ago and whenever we called it a warehouse and you could create that and it was it by the time we rolled it out it became a, a massive task and it was a very you know we couldn't really bring that on so i and think nobody knows what's in it exactly yeah. and so i think one of the things that you know we're seeing that the people are undertaking this kind of work now is start small take into those bite size and really define and don't worry about making those mistakes you know because you can roll it back or you can create one uh, you know, you're creating your incremental growth, so you're actually winning a little bit by just incrementally adding stuff into it, so that you don't create this massive uh, design, you know, and then get paralyzed by that. So that's something that we've been seeing, and some of our clients are really responding to that. It's a, a good aspect, I think. This is also why we and how we took our journey, especially around our uh, analytics platform. So what are the, the 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 starting points? So what are the good use cases which we can use and then we develop, will develop that further and further. But uh, we haven't took, let's say, the whole journey over months to gather all the requirements. So we started with where we think with the business together, where's the most value in, and then, like you said, do it uh, in, in, in an agile way and uh, adding more use cases uh, during the time. And I think that's a really important one. There's so many times I've seen organizations embark on building an application or a system or and try and do it in its entirety. And five years later, they're still going, they're still going. Everyone's waiting on this project that's still going. You know, some people ride these projects out until retirement. It's having those <laughs> short-term objectives, short-term deliverables that add value to the business. That's the way to approach it. Yeah, it's really like the, the fail fast, prove fast, and evolving architecture because technology changes every six months. <laughs> Next year, you will be a completely different technology. You talked about, I, I was reading through, I mean, you talked about data warehouses a million years ago, <laughs> and we have data lakes. Now we're talking about data lake houses, yeah. right? With, with, uh, so so what the data lake house is pretty much how we can uh, acid compliance in a da data warehouse, transaction, non-transactional, and unstructured data, right? Yeah. So the technology is evolving, so you can't, it's like you're not building um, um, skyscraper, right? So technology is um, 
and mobile software. So it's pretty much an evolving architecture. I think that's the key. So uh, coming on to the point, I think um, Chris, you made uh, it's like IT, like tail wagging the dog from driving business versus business driving IT. But Frank, you rightly said it's, it's a one team, sort of a one dream sort of approach. So in, in your organization, like how, how does that work? Like what, what are the approaches? Like most of the time business would ask, I need this now versus like, okay, six months later. So how do you, from integration and a data provisioning point of view, sell that roadmap and try to convince uh, the delivery approach? I think it's a general question, right? To convince one, uh, someone who is not, uh, let's say, always in the priority first, right? Yes. It's not just, let's say, to an ETM journey or data or digitalization journey. No, I think um, uh, you, you need a kind of um, alignment board which can help where you have, let's say, people sitting from the business who can own and who makes decision together with IT. And um, if you have uh, introduced something like that, then for sure you can take a, a talk about priorities. But I think sometimes it's more important also to think lift, uh, left and right. So what are the options? Maybe you can bring in, let's say, some external companies which are helping to, let's say, a peak of work or some, to build some foundation which, is, uh, which needs to be in just one time. So I think there are always uh, opportunities, um, not saying to do everything at the same time and to deliver everything at uh, time zero, but um, there are some options. Um, if you take that into account, then you can achieve maybe more than doing every, everything in a sequence. Yeah. And the prioritization part, is always interesting. You know, there's always louder voices in every organisation. Um, and for example, if a new product is tradable and there's profit in it, it has to be done. But there's other priorities that may not appear to be urgent until something goes wrong in that space. So particularly if you look at the post-trade world, if front office are moving at a speed that post-trade isn't able to keep up with, <coughs> things go wrong, firms lose money. Yeah. To me, it always comes down to the money, right? In any technology, it's a business problem which relates to the money and, and where it is. If you look at the panel being about interoperability, right, and you look at post-trade and, and where it's all going, it's what does it do for the business? If I look at the, the pace of change in the industry right now, we could say this about any generation. I can always pick a point in time and say, oh, it's the fastest it's ever been. But they're really, you need to be responsive in the business. And if you have interoperability in place, you can go to the responsiveness. Now, if I go to the leadership and say, hey, I want to go to a back office project right now, and I'm worried about margining, and I'm worrying about you know, gas trading, and I'm worried about all these things, it's probably not in the top three things keeping my CEO up at night if I'm at an enterprise. It's probably not driving his business. But if, if you can build the business case of why you need that for the business, you'll probably get in the queue somewhere. Probably not today, but you probably will because you're going to be positioned for the future to do these things. When I talked about that future killer app, that means... Can I interact with whatever new application comes out? Do I have the hooks in place? Can my data go back and forth? Can I do all these things? And can I get value for the business today? And that's how we're, we're driving it today, is coming in from an ROI point of view. But I can't promise that I'm going to keep the CEO's ear every time I get it, or that he's going to go with a third party. <laughs> <laughs> OK, thank you, gentlemen. I think um, is there any other points uh, to make, John, from your point? Um, I think uh, I'd like to open up the uh, uh, audience uh, for uh, any Q&A. I think, as we definitely, from, from our perspective, like the idea of when we partner with somebody, then also figure out, is there some additional areas we can go into? So we had discussions about, can we not apply some of that kind of effort model to other markets or to other commodities? Because at the end, it's the same problem that needs to be solved. And if you establish that, you're able to kind of connect for that 90% that's typical European data, then let's add the other 10% and try to provide that connectivity and that service uh, for another area as well. Or there's a communication aspect that the CTRM is currently not kind of covering. So maybe we just generate for all the trades some similar effort like file that we say, okay, we hand that over maybe together with the paper confirmation and then 
you send a combination of electronic data and paper out and your counterparty maybe use that, even if it's not part of that end effort scope or uh, should be confirmed as this. So it definitely, I think this is where we like, is there value? Yes. And this is a, exactly that standardization we talked earlier about to kind of maybe then applying some of that stuff and bring it to other places and create value like that. There are also some, and there are a couple of other um, like blockchain initiatives. You know, we, we know about Bact and a couple of others, and I think they're in. They're making some strides, but um, I think it needs a little bit more industry backing to be able to do it. I, I firmly believe that, you know, the if the software vendors and the industry they don't work together and the players, and it just becomes more of a let's go find a a problem and let's solve it with some really nice technology so otherwise people won't take it so in that example right that you give right they're a consortium so they have many bosses almost like you would have in an efet except that they have investor bosses to yeah. do it so it's a little bit different model in the industry coming back and saying hey we really want a standard here right so what typically would come out is they'll, they'll win some if they do everything on boats that's what they do settlement for right and they get mm -hmm. blockchain that will become a de facto standard in their vision. That's, you know, if I've asked Etienne what he wants to say, that's what he would say, I want the standard. Um, but it's just probably not there yet because it's very early in the life cycle. So from a standards point of view, there's other standards bodies that we're working with. It's not just EFET that are trying to sign on, at least from post-trade. And when you look at like uh, billing and invoicing and stuff, there's, there's plenty of standards to choose from, right? The question is what meets unique energy industry because it was that easy, you would just use software that the financial industry is using. You would use software that other industries are using. And there is enough nuance in this business that you really need the institutional knowledge to do it well and in, in, in some sense. So you can't just take the standard. So that's why we bet to start with the EFET standard, but we have multiple standards that we, we support. I think that's another question. <laughs> okay, I think that's two questions uh, from sliders. First one, characteristic when it comes to bringing parties on board. Electronic confirmations happened quickly when the U.S. government mandated it. Can softer approaches work? So, for oh, oh, so let me make sure I'm answering the right questions here. Uh, confirmations um, is in existence today in Europe. Let, let's be clear: there's been existence. It's ten years old. It's, it's not a new. There's no carrot or stick needed. It, it's out there. The reason it hasn't really come to full fruition, what it hasn't done, is it, it was the first incremental step. What everybody had wanted in the industry was full automation, end to end. But if you look at the project that was done in the beginning, the legacy solution, it's still manual by design. You still have to go log in and do things, log into screens and things like that. That's what the limitation is. If I can get it to be digital end to end and I can start doing amazing things, which I can now do, it's moving by itself. So when Fidectus brought confirmations out, our initial product was settlement. Our audience or our, our, our users said, hey, we want to do confirmations the same way you do settlement. Do that for us. And very quickly, we've got an island of folks using our solution for confirmations. And so that goes back to what this panel's about. Well, but I still need to reach the entire market. That's what's important. Yeah. And as long as you can reach the whole market. Now, from a Fidectus point of view, we hedged our bets. We said, look, we bet on the standard. We're all a part of the standard. But we also built our product that it didn't matter if there was ever a standard. You always can talk to everybody through our platform. But I don't think we need regulation to do that. that that's more, it's a business it's case. Business. Yeah, we have two more minutes and two questions to find. So, so would you say a closed or open ecosystem best facilitates reliable interoperability? I think it will be. Uh, John, you want to take that? So the first, I'm trying to see the. Uh, I'll read it for you. Would you say a closed or open ecosystem best facilitates reliable interoperability? I would say, I mean, define closer. You know, I'm going to sound like a very consultant, but. <laughs> <laughs> what do you define by a close or open? But I think, I mean, by the nature of it, open would be a much better thing. I mean, I guess one of the things that I, I'd like to see more from the, the industry, especially the, some of these players, are how do you get the data out quicker? How do you make it so that it becomes an easier ask rather than going and mining for that information? And if you start, have that in mind going forward and building all of your applications, how do I take out data? Because a lot of applications are by nature just bringing in the data. So how do you also think about, I need to pu put those plugs in so that it will push the data out whenever it's needed so you can do things with it. So I would say that. Last question, name one standard you think which would be the most relevant at this time of energy crisis and recession. It's a tough one. So. That is a tough one. <laughs> 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 
Yeah. <laughs> 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 um, that's a very interesting question. What is the most value in? I would say it varies a little bit in what kind of area you are in from a business standpoint. So if you are running, let's say, a business with um, tons of uh, tank farms, for example, then it might make sense that you implement there, let's say, a standard because this gives you a lot of efficiency also in transparency for the business in terms of data, reliable data. Um, Potentially, that would be maybe one one of the most um, area where I would would say, beside of standardiza standardization of bringing um, on-prem systems, which we have still in place at everyone, I think, and cloud technology together, I think that will be another big win. Maybe not from the business, from the first view, but uh, if you take a bigger, uh, a deeper view, then it would help too. So, if I may add just yes. one quick. I think from my point of view, it would be uh, more on the pre-trade because of, with all the sanctions that are coming through, the, the vetting that you need to do for most of the comp companies that you need to do now, I think something that could easily, you would have, a, you know, most of my clients are looking at it and say, I don't even know how to start or how do I dig into the third level of this thing? So it becomes quite difficult. So if there was a way to standardize that, I, I would say that would be the standard. That's right. I think we are almost out of time. Uh, thanks, gentlemen. It's very insightful. Uh, I managed to talk about interoperability and keep all of you awake as well after lunch. <laughs> so, so I think uh, next session is building a data governance program to enable for the growth and innovation. Nice, it comes from interoperability to governance. Uh, so Ian, uh, to take over. Yeah.